Welcome to the NIHR Dementia Researcher podcast, brought to you by DementiaResearcher.nihr.ac.uk, in association with Alzheimer's Research UK and Alzheimer's Society, supporting early career dementia researchers across the world. Hello, and thank you for tuning in to the Dementia Researcher podcast, the show that brings together researchers to share their work and career tips and brings you news of some of the latest developments in the field. I'm Adam Smith. I'm the Programme Director for Dementia Researcher at UCL. And for those that don't know, I also have the honour of chairing the iStart PIA to Elevate Early Career Researchers, or PIAs for short. And it's the work of our PIA that myself and my fantastic guests today are going to be talking about. For those with long memories, you'll recall the podcast we shared back in September last year when we launched the worldwide survey to explore the thoughts and experiences of early career researchers. And today, we're delighted to be able to share the results of that survey. To discuss what we found, I'm joined by Dr. Beth Shaban from the University of Pittsburgh, who is Deputy Chair of Peers. Hello, Beth. Hi, everybody. I've also joined by Wagner Broom from the University of Gothenburg and Peers as Continent Lead for South America. Hi, Wagner. Hey, everyone. And last but not least, we have Lindsay Wilkovich from Harvard's Medical School and Mass General Hospital, who is currently the outgoing continent lead for North America. Hello, Lindsay. (laughs) Hi there. Brilliant. It's great to have you all here. So let's quickly hear a little bit more about our guests. Uh, Beth, could you go first? Absolutely. I am a new assistant professor of epidemiology at the University of Pittsburgh. And as Adam mentioned, the vice chair of the peers professional interest area. And I'm also a scholar at the University of Pittsburgh Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. I'm a population neuroscientist, which means I combine my training in epidemiology, neuroscience, and social and behavioral determinants of health to do my research. Um, And I have a new career development grant from the U.S. National Institutes of Health, applying a population neuroscience framework to understand gender and sex differences in the pathway from cerebral small vessel disease to Alzheimer's disease. That's exciting. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Promotion and the grant, of course. Uh, Wagner. So I'm a PhD student. I started my PhD in uh, the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul in southern Brazil. And now I'm doing a visiting period uh, of my PhD here at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. And I'm mostly working with blood biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease uh, and addressing the challenges that we have to implementing them into clinical practice. So hot topic right now. And I see for, for our listeners, of course, don't have the benefit of video, but I, I see you've got a, a quite a new Scandinavian a- addition to your face. Yeah, yeah, it was time for it was time for a change, and why not a mustache, right? <laughs> it, it absolutely suits you. It, it's perfect for Sweden. Um, Lindsay, can you come next? Uh, I'm a postdoctoral fellow in Brad Hyman's lab at MGH, as you mentioned, um, and I conduct uh, primarily basic research using transgenic mouse models. Um, and I actually study uh, the interaction between classical neuropathological lesions in Alzheimer's disease and uh, their related immune processes, which is a lot of fun. Um, and I relocated from Canada within the last year where I completed my PhD at McGill. Uh, so I can definitely relate with a lot of our survey participants and the precarious but exciting experience of working in academia. So I'm super thrilled to be here to talk, to talk about it. Wonderful. Thank you ever so much, everybody, for, for taking time out. We're recording this in the evening. So, of course, we're all in different parts of the world. So it, it's great that you all managed to find time to join us. So let me start by giving a little bit of background and setting the scene. Piers really got started in late 2020, early 2021. And its aims are uh, to encourage people to think about dementia research as their preferred career or research area, and to support and inspire people to remain within the field, focused on providing a, a supportive community that shares advice, tips and resources to help people and to form collaborations. However, we really wanted to have a firm foundation and have a real understanding of what everybody's challenges were at all stages and recognizing that people in different countries may have different challenges. And what better way to get a baseline and to to work out what we really needed to do than with a big old survey. So myself, Beth, Wagner, Lindsay, and uh, two people who can't be with us today, Dr. Sarah Bartels from the Netherlands and Royhan Florin from Nigeria, who 
all got together with support from iStar and Dr. Claire Sexton uh, to, to work out what we might include in a survey. The survey was open during September and October 2021 um, for any early career researchers or someone who'd left the field within the last two years. We received 584 responses from 42 different countries working across all areas of research from clinical work to qualitative and fundamental science across all levels from undergrads to assistant and associate professors. Our definition of an ECR being anyone who hasn't yet uh, managed to achieve tenure. Today, we've published the results of the survey, which you can find at dementiaresearcher.nhr.ac.uk forward slash survey, and there'll be a link with the show notes. The survey had over 160 questions, so clearly we're not going to go through every question in detail today. So instead, we're going to go through each of the sections, and I'm going to ask Lindsay, Beth and Wagner to, to highlight some of the, the key takeaways. So, Beth, um, what more can you tell us about the people who completed the survey and their thoughts on their careers? Absolutely. Um, bear with me a little bit. This will set the stage for all of the rest of the data to come. But some highlights of who our survey respondents were. About 80% were graduate students, postdocs, and early career pretenure faculty. They fell across the full range of dementia research from uh, basic science to neuropsychology, clinical care, public health, technology and dementia, and many more. Um, about 80% fell in the 25 to 44 years of age range, and 66% identified as women. 78% of our respondents identified as heterosexual, 6% as gay or lesbian, and 9% as bisexual. 18% identify as a racial minority or a person of color where they are working, and 38% were in the first generation in their family to go to college or university. Nearly half had moved internationally at some point for work or school. And some of the primary challenges that our respondents identified with moving internationally are the financial costs of moving and being away from family members. Many of our respondents have contracts of three years or less, and about 87% of respondents are worried about short-term contacts contracts sorry, as a barrier to them staying and making progress in dementia research. The respondents are fluent in social media. As Adam mentioned earlier, it's a social media world, and they use it to communicate about science both ways, both sharing their own research and staying up to date in their areas. They also use it to look for jobs. And funding, financial security, and job opportunities and security are identified as the greatest challenges for dementia early career researchers to stay in dementia research and to make progress in their careers. About 80% are at least slightly happy in their current role, but worryingly, about 50% are thinking about leaving dementia research. And that's something I hope we get to talk about a little bit more today. I guess there are a few things that surprised me in there. Was, was there anything that particularly surprised you? I mean, some things in there you kind of expect, like we always, every time we do some of these things, I mean, you, anybody who listens to the podcast will know that, that we have more women who are contributors more. Uh, so I'm not surprised that more, uh, I guess the fact that we had more women complete the survey, than men doesn't necessarily mean there are more women researchers. It's just that they're better at, at taking up the call to action perhaps. Um, but was there anything in there that surprised you particularly? Well, I think really that last point that I mentioned, um, that about 50% are thinking about leaving dementia research. Um, I'm not really sure what I thought it would be, but I thought it would be less. Um, and I think it just really sticks with me because it's so concerning. Um, I think if we're really gonna make progress on, on dementia treatment, care and prevention, got to have the best and brightest minds staying in the field. Um, so the idea that 50% are thinking about leaving is really worrying to me. And I, and I think we need to do, um, do things to find how to um, make it better and retain people and keep them happy. Well, that's a conversation we've been having right now about it's not just about slightly longer contracts, but maybe about creating a more structured framework, perhaps where, where, 
when you take up a PhD, perhaps there's a there's a job, a guaranteed job at the end of it for a year, for example. So you could have a, a PhD with a with a year's placement attached to it. These are things that would be relatively inexpensive, but would would potentially help retain people because it's those bottlenecks that we see where where people drop out post phd or um, within a couple of years of of finishing their first postdocs the other stat you mentioned there that i thought was quite a lot is how many people just how many people move country that's yes it's a lot i mean i think it does really point out the um the global nature of the responses to our survey, which I'm really happy with because we really did want a, a worldwide sense of what's going on with dementia research. So much work has focused on, um, on the United States and Canada and Europe, and it's really important to get a sense of what's going on elsewhere. So I think it's very common um, from what you know, I've heard from you all as my colleagues around the world and from, from some research on this topic that, um, moving is very important in Europe and it's it's somewhat easy to do when I think about it from a US centric perspective because it's a little bit like moving across a state line in the United States in terms of distance. Um, but it really is a lot of people um, who are moving countries and that's pretty surprising um, because it, it can be very um, very stressful and burdensome to people, as they mentioned, both financially and being so far removed from the important supports of their family members. And, and of course, the data is available. So we're going to do some further analysis on this to understand exactly where those movements are happening to and from, I guess. I, I know from talking to Royhan, who obviously isn't with us today, that there are certain countries where clearly, if you're interested in neuroscience or dementia research, there isn't a lot going on in certain countries. And, and you kind of have to move. Moving to the US, for example, or the UK is seen as as something you have to do to retain. But I think also, if you look to the survey, there was a lot of movement between the US and UK. I think we, we jumped backwards and forwards. Overall, what do you, in that section, is there anything that you would pick out as cultural changes that we need to make? Well, I think, um, you know, a focus on potentially longer term contracts. I know from, from some of my own um, training of, of new, uh, PhD students and postdocs that I, that I do that, um, interest in, you know, longer term contracts does make people feel far more stable and supported. And so that's, that's an important thing that we can do. And I'm hopeful that in one of the, I think it might in fact be the next section about some questions relating to the isms, ageism, racism, sexism, that those are areas where we can really intervene to make people um, feel more welcome and supported and like they really want to um, stay because it's not a toxic environment. Um, I think, yeah, I think we really need to hone in on who are these people who are thinking about leaving and what is it that we can do for them to make them change their minds. And that's some of the work that we'll do in the future on some of some of the papers with additional data analysis where we'll try to understand that group of people better. Absolutely. And that's something we're going to talk about a little bit later on as to what comes next, because, because as I said at the start, the survey was really the first step to have a baseline and understand. And now that we know that there are so many people thinking of leaving, we can follow up with with further um, surveys or work or focus groups to to really ask some difficult questions as to what what are the causes behind that thank you very much beth um lindsay uh now that we've heard uh who completed the survey and learned about their challenges and some of their motivations could you maybe talk to their ex the experiences section and 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 some of the more personal aspects of the information we captured yeah i was really surprised to find that most of us experience imposter syndrome like sort of feels kind of backwards. <laughs> like how reassuring would it be to know that, you know, all these people who you think are so talented and confident and skilled and bright, that they experience the exact same insecurities and we often experience them in silence. Um, I think that really speaks to the fact that the academic experience can still feel really isolating even today. And it, it kind of feels like this massive insurmountable hill to climb where only the best and the brightest make it to the top and there's no way we're gonna get there. Um, 
And I think we really should be emphasizing the fact that science is very much a team sport, especially nowadays. Um, and we all have something valuable to contribute and we can do a lot more when we draw on each other's talents. Um, I think the second thing that Beth, Beth actually mentioned, so I was shocked that 50% of respondents with disabilities, um, including those with learning difficulties, still experience ableism. Um, and equally shocked that 64% of those who identify as gay or lesbian or bisexual or other um, experience homophobia. And that's really heartbreaking. Um, it's heartbreaking to know that there are these completely unnecessary and unacceptable barriers that so many of our colleagues still deal with. Um, and there's a lot more for us to do to remove those barriers. Um, and I think equally important, what a tragic loss it would be to the field if we were to lose all of those valuable contributions that those colleagues could potentially make if they felt more welcomed and more valued. And I think that's something we should really be focusing on because those numbers are, are really shocking even now. I completely agree. And that's not something that we've had in our program before as well. We've, we've got support networks for minoritized scientists, which we've talked about on the podcast before as well. But clearly there's so much work still to be done to address the experiences that ECLs are telling us. And, and the survey goes on to talk about just practically how that impacts you as well, doesn't it? And the survey goes on to ask about how that practically impacts people. And, and we hear how they uh, it affects how they interact with co-workers. Um, they feel it's, it's delayed their career progression. Um, how they choose collaborators as, as well is something that's affected and confidence levels, which, of course, when we go back to Beth's point earlier about dropouts, if, if you're experiencing some of these some of these forms of prejudice in the workplace, you're not you're not going to stay, are you? I mean, it's as simple as that. Yeah. And the most interesting thing among all of these, all these sections with respect to mental health and imposter syndrome, ableism, homophobia, the number one effect is that it affects people's confidence and motivation. Um, and I think if someone you know, doesn't want to show up to work every day just because they're experiencing some sort of discrimination or they feel unwelcomed or unvalued, that's a tremendous loss for everybody, including those people who are affected. Um, so definitely, I, I totally echo what you say, that there's a lot more that should be done and that maybe we should be focusing on. I think sometimes as academics, especially in certain areas of the world, that we can feel very progressive and like so we're solving these issues and we're already doing a lot, but there's clearly more that needs to be done. Do you mind if I just briefly add another dimension to that? Um, because I realized that when I started talking about it, I, I did focus in on... Um, making people feel welcome. And I think that's really only part of what's going on here. And I just wanted to call attention to the fact that it's really through uh, structural changes that we, that we can actually impact a lot of these problems. Um, so for example, I'm thinking specifically of racism in the United States at, at um, academic institutions and the proportional representation um, as compared to the US population in, um, you know, among faculty, among postdocs, among PhD students is very, very poor. Um, it's not representative of the of our population at all. And so one interesting, you know, proposal that I've come across recently that I think is a, is a great structural intervention potentially is the idea that you might uh, build in a program Adam, similar to what you were talking about earlier, where um, somebody completes their PhD program or they complete a postdoc, but then the intention is uh, to retain them at that institution to enhance um, equity and justice in terms of who is a faculty member. And so you might have a Black or African American um, postdoc who then is part of this program and stays on with um, uh, an offer of a faculty position at the end of that program. So that's the type of, uh, I just wanna make sure that we include this um, structural thinking because it's not simply about making people feel um, welcome. It's also about changing um, our institutions. So our listeners can't see, but we're all nodding our heads here. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think having more, um 
uh, people in senior positions will make a big difference. I think there's a couple of things I'll pick out from the survey in the sections you mentioned there, Lindsay, which is we, we also asked on the racism question, we asked how people experienced this, whether this was as an individual, systematic or institutional. And it was uh, in as an individual that came out the highest at just under 70 some percent, about 50 percent said uh, it was systematic and it was about I think about 45, sorry, it's a graph and it's not exact, but I think it's about 45% said it was institutional, which does it at least su suggest uh, some of the institutions were improving, but obviously individuals um, were, were still experiencing individual forms of racism that were directly targeted at them. And I, I thought the other thing that was very disappointing was when we asked how helpful the where people uh, their institutions and employers had been in in this um zero percent said their employers had been extremely helpful 62 percent 16 percent said very or somewhat helpful and 40 percent said not helpful at all um which shows that clearly there's a lot more work to be done in in universities and with employers so thank you, Lindsay. I, I obviously gave you one of the harder sections to talk to. Um, I asked this question before, but what does this tell us about the overall culture and what changes are needed? Yeah, I think Beth highlighted some really important uh, changes, not just at the individual level where we can make sort of these uh, small changes in our day-to-day -day interactions, um, but also at the institutional level. Um, and that means making people feel welcome and inviting them to the table um, in positions and um, in situations that can be uh, consequential for the, for the people um, who actually experience this type of discrimination. Thanks, Lindsay. And, and we should say that that whole section is huge. We talk about, uh, we also talk about financial problems. We talk about mental health. I think there were some, some strong, strongly concerning um, data on, on mental health as well, which, which suggested that nearly 60% of all the people who completed the survey had experienced some form of mental health difficulty, particularly anxiety disorders and depression, um, which, also, uh, which also was affecting people's uh, work, their confidence, motivations, how they worked with co-workers, personal ambition, uh, and nearly a third of the people who'd experienced mental health is issues had talked about leaving their institution as a result of that uh, as well. So uh, I'm really pleased that we managed to bring this out of the survey and, and it's given us some really important areas that we need to focus on. Wagner, okay, it's your turn. Um, we ask researchers about some aspects of life as an ECR, particularly about things like conferences, publishing, um, how the pandemic in impacted them. We talked a little bit before already as well about moving countries. Um, as somebody who was impacted by these things personally, you moved countries during the pandemic. Um, tell us, what did the survey find in these areas? Yeah, okay. Moving on to these areas, I mean, uh, I think that uh, as early career researchers, we have all, we're always involved with our projects. And I mean, it always comes a time that we have to present it in conferences, we have to publish it, and uh, it's, it's really interesting to see what people responded to, the, uh, to these uh, in these sections. So for instance, for conferences, uh, considering most of the respondents uh, are in the earlier stages of the career from what we, we took a look from the demographics, of course, we have the whole academic span in the survey, but we have lots of like uh, later uh, PhD students later in their degree and also lots of postdocs. So it was interesting to see that most of the people attend uh, on average two to three conferences a year. And now even with the pandemic, we, we know that it's possible that a couple of these have been online or during the hardest, harshest pandemic years, all of them were online. So I think that this is interesting because I mean, we, we have our, our, our daily research activities, developing our projects. And sometimes the ECRs, depending on how much we engage into conferences, sometimes this can be really time consuming for us to prepare posters and presentations. So I think that two to three conferences per year as the, as the uh, by far the, the largest number of people were attending between that, I think it's, it's interesting to see that uh, it's falling across that range. Uh, but another interesting thing, it's, it's the cost related to going to a conference, for instance, around 85% of people uh, thought that the costs of conference registration or of uh, travel, air tickets and hotels, and etc. kept them from actually attending more conferences. 
So we clearly see that the cost is, is a burden for ECRs. Uh, and I also think it was really interesting to take a look at what people think they take as the benefit from the conference. But before looking at the benefit, it's interesting, it's interesting to see what is their main, what is the ECR's main motivation to go to a conference. And by far the number one was scientific updates. But then actually when you go to see the benefits, like uh, what we have in top one is expanding your network, uh, gaining recognition for your work uh, and forming new collaborations. So I think that this is something that we all sort of start to experience at some point in our career, that uh, sometimes we end up getting the scientific updates from home and the conference is really about that more networking and talking to people about the science almost more than getting to know more, more science. But of course, you need the updates. So I, I mean, it's just interesting to see that people actually uh, really take uh, benefit from uh, networking with people and talking to people in conference. And moving quickly to talk a little bit about publishing, which is also something that, I mean, it's always the, the elephant in the ECR's mind room or something like that. I mean, we're always worried about what we're going to do with, with our work. And 90% of the respondents uh, responded that they felt pressured or very pressured to publish their results, which, I mean, of course, uh, we need some degree as human beings, we need some degree of pressure to motivate us to keep going. But it's, it's hard to, to see that lots of people are actually feeling very pressured. And from the mental health section, we also know that this leads up to a lot of anxiety and burden for us to carry our research activities. So I think one of the challenges is, is for people to get proper advice, to understand that they don't need to put any more pressure than the natural pressure that involves publishing your work. Um, and in terms of barriers for getting their work published, uh, the top three items that were pointed was no time for writing. I guess that this is something that everyone can relate to. I mean, we're always involved with doing our experiments or doing more, uh, I don't know, uh, lab related activities or conducting our projects. And we end up not being capable of fitting some time in our routine to write. So that was by far the number one. And a couple of two other ones that are a bit more troublesome and are not so much within the lab life of the student of, or of the ECR is that uh, publication fees are uh, a big challenge for lots of people for them to get their work published. And I mean, we know that this can be a special problem for uh, researchers outside countries that uh, actually work with dollars and euros or pounds, for instance, and then everything gets more expensive because they're not making your national grants in the currency that you have to pay them. And, uh, and one thing that is especially burdensome that people pointed out also quite frequently was regarding the formatting for journals. I mean, this is clearly a, a place where uh, uh, journals and editors can take action. We still have a very poor and non-unified system of manuscript submission. And it's just uh, really, really, it's just a pain that every time you get a rejection or you have to resubmit to somewhere else, uh, also quite burdensome that you have to uh, adapt to these often strange requirements of the journal. Uh, and also just uh, to finish the publishing section, lots of ECRs are always very, I mean, I talked to a lot of people when they got their first peer review invitation to review a paper for a journal. And I mean, everyone is always so happy when the first invitation comes and et cetera, but then people just realize that they, are getting an invitation, but they have no training whatsoever to conduct that review. And also lots of people pointed that, like, I mean, 80% had already engaged in peer review somehow, but um, a lot, uh, little of them, a few of them only had received uh, training. So this is also something that's pretty easy for us to, to make it better, is just to get more training on peer review. Uh, and regarding the effects of the pandemic, I'm not going to go too much detail on that because we have also been working on a separate uh, report to highlight this, which our colleague Sarah Bato uh, has uh, led, a project she has led, and will soon be sharing these results. But I mean, no surprises. The pandemic affected almost everyone. It delayed almost everyone's projects. For many people, it also generated lots of um, issues with their contracts. So they had to renew their positions or, or trying to find another way to extend their contracts. And uh, I mean, it's 
clearly, clearly the pandemic has uh, affected everyone a lot. And we will be uh, seeing more of that in our uh, separate reports soon. Okay, yeah, now moving on to, to the moving countries section. Of course, we talked a little bit about that earlier. Uh, and for me, it's a, it's a very important topic. I mean, I'm just now completing one year here in Sweden uh, after leaving Brazil for this uh, visiting PhD period here. And uh, I think it's really interesting to see what people consider their, their like for those who have moved countries so far, uh, what were their main reasons? And I, I really see that the reason for you to move countries uh, for a part of your uh, research career really depends a lot on your starting point, on the place you're, you're starting your career. Because I mean, like, for instance, uh, the top two uh, uh, reasons that people listed as their, as their main reasons for moving countries was one, that they viewed it as essential for their career progress, and two, that they wanted to seek new experiences. And I mean, of course, talking just generally about my, my, my take on this, is just that if you're maybe already in, in, in a country or in a region or in a research center with sufficient funding, I totally see how, how, how for instance, getting new experiences might also be a, a motivating factor for you to move countries. But for instance, uh, like Adam mentioned from uh, Roy Hans, uh, perspective, our continent uh, representative for Africa, and I can also talk about from people in South America, is that many times moving countries is one of the alternatives, is one of the only alternatives that you have to conduct some of your projects. Because I mean, uh, uh, I already mentioned that one big problem that we have, for instance, in, in Latin America is the currency. Most of the countries work with different currencies. And when you convert that to euros and dollars, that becomes nothing instantly. Uh, and that's what you have to pay for your research products because they all come from the US and Europe mostly. So, I mean, this is just a, an example. And of course, in, in lots of these um, low and middle income countries, uh, we have lots of issues with government and economical crisis. So the research budgets are not stable. For instance, in Brazil now, we have been experiencing major cuts in the past few years. So. Uh, for a lot of people in that position, moving countries is really just a great alternative for you to, to try to, to move on and do some of the things you want and that you think that you need for your projects elsewhere. And then, of course, uh, brain drain happens and oftentimes these people don't come back to their original countries, which is also uh, something that everyone needs to work on so these countries can retain their sciences. So, I mean, I think that this was my general overview of these uh, four big sections. Sorry, Wagner, I gave you I gave you some pretty hefty topics to cover there. I think um, that, yeah, it was great to see that so many people were happy to be back at in-person conferences, particularly and how many how many they attended. It was uh, quite insightful to also ask how much people thought they should pay. Um, and I, I was I was quite surprised. I, I thought some of the, I, I would agree with what everybody said on the price. So they said that they should pay about 200 and some dollars for an in-person conference or 54 for online and webinars could be charged at $20. I, we could be charging $20 for our webinars where I, I didn't realize we could do that. We've been doing them for free all this time. No, uh, yeah, webinars <laughs> should be free. But you're right. I think when you talk about the contradictions, there are a few contradictions in there. And Beth talked at it at the start. I'm sure we'll come to it again in, when we talked about people being happy in their jobs, but thinking about leaving. You know, the, the, the survey's f full of interesting little bits of data in there. There's so much information. As I said at the start, there's 169 questions in here. And that doesn't even address the open ended questions that we have, which is where there's so much rich information and when we ask people so what do you think would do that change and giving people these big open boxes which usually i know when you do that in a survey that's that's a killer for a survey nobody will go near it but they did some of these sections had over over 150 200 comments in there on a, how to address some of these challenges or what their own personal experiences were of some of these some of these things or what they thought would make conferences better and, and this is all data we're going to be working with uh, over the next few months to, to produce some papers to inform of our, our work as well. So, Beth, I'm going to come back to you for the penultimate section around um, leaving academia, something I'm sure you've never considered yourself. Um, but, but what did this tell us in those last few pages? Pages 51 to 52 for anybody who's got the uh, downloaded the report already. 
<laughs> well, just full disclosure, I identify very strongly with many of the things in this report, and I have thought of leaving academia plenty of times, which may be an interesting conversation for another day. That's another but, podcast. We'll get you back right, on there to talk about right. that. Right, or a blog or something. <laughs> yeah. um, but so, so but a bit more than 10% of our respondents, 61 out of the 584 had left dementia in the past two years. And so we're eligible to answer these questions. I just like to point out, since I am an epidemiologist, <laughs> I think this is fantastic because this gets around this problem that, that epidemiologists call survival bias, where when you have the people responding who make it, by staying in dementia research, right? The PhD students, the postdocs who survive to make it to be faculty members, you, you can get a biased and incorrect perspective of what's really going on here. It's critically important to talk to the people who have left. So about 10% of these um, respondents were eligible to answer these questions. And many left because they couldn't find a job they needed more stability um, or they had no funding that could support them continuing on in this career um, since we're so driven by grant funding. Uh, many are now working in a non-dementia academic research setting or a nonprofit. And one thing that I think was really fascinating um, that we asked was what would bring you back? You know, if you left, what is something that could be done that could bring you back? And 72% said they would consider returning under certain circumstances. And so the themes that really emerged about that were improved stability and permanent positions, um, opportunities to work part-time. This is a very uh, fascinating option, which I never, ever hear discussed in the academic research setting. Um, the third was increased funding. Fourth was more jobs, uh, particularly at a senior level. And then finally improved geography, meaning that they would want positions that were closer to home for them, not reliant on them having to travel to major cities to be taking part in dementia research. And so I think these are really um, important things for us to consider as we move forward and make suggestions, you know, about what could be done that would would keep people from leaving and bring people back uh, into the space. And and I realized um, in in those questions, of course, we there were also questions that weren't necessarily um, you wouldn't negatively associate because I mean, obviously, people don't necessarily not remain in dementia research because it's something that they couldn't do. It could be that a better a better thing or their PhD was just part of a, a, you know, as a training for the thing that they really wanted to, to go on to do. Um, but I was interested to see that 58% of people were still somehow their next job they've moved into, if they had, was still connected to dementia. And I wonder whether this is, you know, people going on to psychoms and, and doing other different things. Yeah. Or even someone, you know, someone getting into a, uh... A position like you where you are working with this organization that is really purposefully reaching out to early career researchers like that that would be um in the psychoms vein but sort of um also in in supporting people staying in the field so there there are a number you know of careers that people could go into that would still be dementia relevant dementia adjacent uh, nearly everybody we work with at the, I know who I work with at Alzheimer's Society, Alzheimer's Research UK and Alzheimer's Association, they're all, they've all done PhDs previously and often dementia related and the, those experiences have set them, set them up for those jobs. Thank you, uh, Beth. So I, I've kept the last part for myself, which is around what people told us about what support they'd need. Um, the rest of the survey gives us a, a great sense of what culturally needs to change and where we need to draw attention from partners. But in this section, these are things that we can really do something about to, to help. Um, we gave a big list of, of all areas you typically see covered um, for what people might want support in. And the top 10 in priority order were uh, grant and fellowship writing. Uh, anybody surprised by that? <laughs> no, no, nodding, shaking heads. Um, the next uh, top area that people felt they needed support with was building collaborations. 
And I think I wonder whether that's related to the pandemic as well, that we've only really had the opportunity to network more on social media and with our immediate colleagues. So um, getting a little going back to in-person events and learning how to be sociable again and how to talk at, when you stood in front of a poster or find collaborators um, is, a, is an interesting one. But that came out number two. Then we had creating and managing budgets, something that um, might not be the the most exciting topic, but it's all something we have to do when we writing those grant applications and Matt, particularly when you're managing a team for the first time, or you take on running your first lab or your first big project, um, general career development, followed by research methods, implementing research findings, implementation, a top one that um, we know the survey showed that there was some frustration there about, I know, um, Wagner talked earlier about people feeling pressured, of course, to publish their results and for qualitative researchers and those working clinically, there was that extra pressure because you don't just want to publish your results. You also want to then see that bring about practical change, um, which there are increasing number of grants that you can apply to to do that. But that was an extra pressure that I think qualitative uh, researchers and particularly clinical researchers experienced. Um, publishing came lower down the, the, the list than I thought, and science, communications, and reviewing were the last two. Um, so anybody who's running a conference right now, if you're going to run another session on how to use Twitter, I would suggest maybe skipping that and doing something on how to manage a budget instead. That's the, the big takeaway for me. Um, so from an ISAP perspective, we're going to get to work and make this happen. And of course, one of the ways we're going to get to do this is through the ISTART pop-up academy at this year's AIC. Um, I don't think details on that have been fully released yet, but if you're attending the AIC this year in person in San Diego in July, we're going to have this pop-up academy during the lunchtime sessions when, and we'll have, um, I think it's 16 different sessions over the three days, most of which would fall in that top 10 category. So be sure to, to keep an eye out for those and get your place book for the AIC. Uh, we're also going to work through our continent working groups to deliver uh, webinars and support people locally, recognizing that collaboration workshops may need to be different if you work in Europe compared to if you work in South America or um, that, that some of the the support you might want in North America. We've great finding out that people want grant and fellowship support, but that's of course, globally, when we zero that down in on everybody who responded in the UK or in Australia, we might find actually what came out as number one in Australia, didn't come out as number one in the US. Um, through our continent working groups and through leads like Wagner and Lindsay, we want to target our support to the places where it's needed, if that all makes sense. Um, and if you want to get involved in those continent working groups, you'll find details on how in the show notes. Um, we also heard from people um, about how they wanted to receive the support. Our survey respondents highlighted mentoring and one-to-one -one and small group support as being the top areas that they wanted it. Um, and so we're going to try and focus on giving those areas a priority, set up small working groups to, to work together on some of these, these difficulties instead of just, you know, another webinar or another blog is, is to try to actually bring people together to, to collaborate. Honestly, there's so much more we could say. Uh, and today we've only scratched the surface of, of what the survey covers. I, I would absolutely strongly recommend you go away and have a look at the data for yourself. We're going to make the data available for you as well. So you can really get into that. You can apply to us to, to access that, to do your own analysis. We've also got a big long list of lots of uh, pieces of analysis and further papers that we're working on using this data. And you'll find all of that information, including the reports, which is also in an accessible format as well for anybody who has visual impairments. All of that is on our website at dementiaresearch.nhr.ac.uk forward slash survey. So next steps, Lindsay, we're working on a, a number of papers and analysis. Could you give us an example, perhaps, of some of those things that we're looking at? I think the short term objective for sure is to finish up the analyzing the survey results and to work towards publishing the findings in open access journals. And I think when we first endeavored to 
to put the survey together, we thought that we would make some super interesting cool paper with all the results into one, but we actually found that there's much more nuanced, interesting information if we sort of parcel it up and focus on um, individual issues. So for example, um, one of the papers we're, we're formulating at the moment is focused on, uh, on the impact of COVID on EC ECRs and dementia research. Um, and how institutions can best respond. So that's just an example of a more uh, focused, honed in topic that, that we're putting more effort into. Um, we're also focusing on formulating initiatives to support priority areas that were identified by respondents. Um, and I think with a unique focus on regional and geographical needs, that's some of the more um, uh, excuse me, zoomed in information that we were able to extract from the survey. Um, and I think one thing that became clear uh, from sifting, sifting through all this interesting information um, was that there's actually a lot more interesting information that we're hoping to further extract from respondents. So we're preparing uh, further survey work to continue monitoring and exploring uh, some of the topical issues from, from the survey that we've already conducted, um, including at the continent level. It's, it's breaking that down, isn't it? I thought that too. I mean, I, I just wanted to <laughs> I wanted to take the whole survey and then split it down the middle and, and then also see, right, what did what was the difference between what the male perspective on so many of the issues issues were or the, the female perspective or the US perspective on compared to the European one? They, and I, I would have been fascinated to do that across all these questions. But um, again, We've only got so many hours in the day, right? And this, this is something yeah, going it was, zero. It was a really short-term volley. Like we had so many questions for people and they provided us so many good answers. And they were like, wait, 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 we have so many more questions now. So I think that's what the future surveys will uh, help us dive into. Thank you, uh, Lindsay. Yeah. Um, Wagner, uh, what do you hope we'll uh, what do you hope people will do with these results? We've given this information. What what do we want them to do with this this information? Well, I mean, I mean just Today, in this brief scratching the surface talk, we already uh, we already covered so many topics, and I mean there is so much room for action. Uh, I mean there's so many things to do in an individual level to tackle these more uh, social and human related issues of what the, this these challenges that people face every day that they shouldn't need to face. There's so much that can be done. Uh, in other aspects as well for like the publishing part there's so much that journals could do to make researchers lives easier i mean they are already exploited <laughs> and they make our lives harder so i mean there's this is something that uh, I mean, if clear. Nothing, absolutely and if nothing else i think people can go away and look at some of these results and feel that they're not alone like if if you think you know you're the only one who's having financial difficulties or thinks the the peer review system or is is not great because they're waiting ages for re, their collaborators to respond and they're um, struggling with anxiety and things like these this this survey should hopefully demonstrate that people aren't alone but also it brings out what we need so i don't want to end on a negative point so we're, we're going to Beth, I'm going to come to you lastly. Give me uh, some big takeaways and uh, tell tell me something that the survey found that was was positive. Because there are, I, I, we focused. I feel like we're slightly focusing on the negatives, but there are lots of positive things in here as well. People, you know, uh, do clearly love their jobs. But let's hear it from you. Yeah, absolutely. So just to return to uh, one of the things that I highlighted earlier, I think it's about 80% um, or even a little higher of the respondents who are who are at least slightly happy with um, their jobs. And I think that's fantastic. I think they're excited um, about sharing their own science. Um, so they commented on this on being on social media and using it purposefully to communicate their science. Um, I think that gets a, a large, a larger swath of the general public and not just not just communicating to other researchers, but communicating to the public who ultimately um, could benefit from our research. I think also an interesting thing that we didn't get to talk about um, is how did people uh, come to their positions? What made them interested in doing the type of work that they're doing? And um, a number of people were just curious by nature, just inherently curious and wanting to do research. 
a number of people um, were fascinated specifically with research. So not just a general curiosity, but something about research really pulled them in. And then another large group of people had experience directly with um, people living with dementia. Um, and I think that's very common. Um, so if you ask people working you know, in our field, whether they've had a grandparent or a family friend or um, aunt or uncle, parent who has experienced dementia and they've interacted with them directly, you know, oftentimes you'll find that that is the case. And that's been a huge motivation for people to be involved. Um, I know for myself, that's the case that I've had a, um, a grandparent who who had dementia and who, um, you know, at points interacting with me when I was a little girl thought that I was my mother and was asking about me being a nurse because my mom was a nurse. Um, and working, working to prevent that happening to someone else and working to provide her better care than she had when she was, you know, still living um, is something that motivates me very much. And I think all of that's very, very exciting to know that people are curious, they want to learn more, and they want to help people, and that's what's pulled them in. So hopefully that can help us um, to, to end on a higher note um, and can help us also to, to focus on something positive, some positive things that we can do to pull people in uh, to the dementia research space and to keep them here. It's not just preventing the negative. It's also harnessing these positive um, things that attract people into the field and keep them with us. Thank you, Beth. I, you did a wonderfully well in describing that. I, I completely uh, concur with your position. You, you clearly have a, a an early career researcher community who are passionate about their jobs. They like what they do. There's this contrast because everybody said that they, they like their job, but they're also thinking about leaving. And I, I think they don't want to leave. Nobody wants to leave. I think it's sometimes, you know, they're just looking for that little bit of stability, the longer contract, just some small cultural changes that could make a huge difference. And I think by and analyzing the data further, we can have a look if that's in particular countries or, or if that's across the board um, as well. And I think there were some good results in there as well. People had felt report, quite supported during the pandemic, particularly as well. And when you looked at some of the discrimination issues, um, individual um, supervisors and institutions were often very supportive um, and had been very helpful, particularly in addressing some of the things around disabilities uh, as well. And I think when we looked at the discrimination, we, we didn't talk about this much before, but there was a perception that things weren't getting worse. They weren't getting better across the board. I think it was only sexism marginally that came out as getting slightly better by like 1% was the perception anyway. Um, but nothing was getting worse. It just wasn't getting better either, which of course is something we need to do. We need to get better. Um, thank you so much. Honestly, again, just have a look at the results for yourself. Uh, it's time to close up today's podcast. I want to thank Beth, Wagner and Lindsay, and of course the others, so many others that have contributed towards this report, Dr. Sarah Bartles and Dr. Royham Florin, the rest of the peers executive committee who helped so much with the promotion of the survey, the iStart team, um, who of course helped us um, bring brought us all together in the first place and every one of you all the listeners that took part and took time to to complete the survey and provide us with those comments again i'm sure you don't need to be reminded of this but you can find a link to the actual report and the survey results in the show notes below and finally if you aren't aware i start recently changed its pricing structure and it's now free for all students worldwide and all researchers of all grades in lower middle income and upper middle income countries. So please do consider joining it. I really can't see any reason for you to not do when it's free. Uh, you get uh, tons of opportunities. You get um, support, uh, access to webinars, uh, journals, a reduction and on the iStart uh, AIC ticket price and some specific conference like AIC Neuronext has always been free in the past to members. Um, so you can find out details on how to become a member of I Start at als.org forward slash iStart. And of course, when you join, you then get to tick the boxes of the PIAs you like to join. 
and you should join the PIA for early career researchers so that we can we can provide you with the support you need. Um, Thank you very much, everybody, for listening. Any questions, any issues, or if the, you want to talk about the survey, you can um, tweet using the hashtag ECRPIA. And we're going to be tweeting all day today with uh, some, some little highlights of the stats uh, using that hashtag. So do take a look and give us all a follow on Twitter as well. Thank you. Brought to you by DementiaResearcher.nihr.ac.uk in association with Alzheimer's Research UK and Alzheimer's Society, supporting early career dementia researchers across the world.